Once a marvel in the Pittsburgh skies, the city's lost sky bus represented an era of innovation that met an unexpected fate as in its heyday, this ambitious transportation system promised unparalleled convenience and efficiency, ferrying passengers through the bustling cityscape with ease. However, what began as a visionary solution eventually succumbed to unforeseen challenges, falling victim to the twists of fate and technological hurdles. But how did this promising symbol of progress meet that untimely demise? Stay tuned to find out as today we discover the history of Pittsburgh's lost sky bus. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. This video is brought to you by Bespoke Post, a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome top shelf goods from under the radar brands. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based right here in the US. Every month, they introduce members to cool new products, outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen, clothing, and more. They even have live oysters. It's all based on a preference quiz they fill out. In fact, they now offer a new membership program where you can get really great deals all year round. I'm talking like 30% off or more sometimes, and it's totally free to join. Preview your box before it's shipped. You'll get a box of awesome assigned to you, and before it's shipped, you'll get a preview of what comes inside to decide if you'd like to one, keep it, two, swap it for a different box, or three, skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. I recently chose the Weekender box with the Weekender bag, which provides maximum utility, but with the cultural stylings of a world traveler from the 19th century. And I just received the Switchback box, providing me with all the tools I need when I'm in the field, from the basic 546 knife, trim fold shovel, a pocket-sized waterproof lantern, flashlight, a military marching compass, and fire starter meaning I'm well prepared for the challenges of nature. And if this sounds like a good deal to you, it's about to get even better because I've got you covered with a major discount. To get a free mystery gift with your purchase, click the link in the description and enter history gift at checkout or go to bespokepost.com slash history gift. Thank you Bespoke Post for supporting the channel. And now back to Pittsburgh's lost sky bus. For the context of our story, it's important to understand that Pittsburgh is a city in Pennsylvania in the capital of Allegheny County. The city has been very important since the 19th century due to the presence of important coal deposits and its excellent location on the Ohio River, which is fully navigable and a major tributary of the Mississippi River. It soon became one of the most important industrial cities in America and the world, especially in the steel industry. So much so that it's referred to in pop culture as Steel City. The city played a key role during the Second World War when war production required many of Pittsburgh's raw materials and industries. The economic boom of the 1940s and 50s led to a significant increase in the population, which grew to almost half a million for the city alone, and about 700,000 by the early 1960s, which surprisingly is actually about 400,000 more inhabitants than today's population of 300,000. Anyhow, the production of a certain type of material and the increase of population quickly made Pittsburgh not only an economically rich city, but also one of the most polluted cities in the world. And within a few decades, this huge influx of people working in the steel industry soon led to a problem of congestion on the roads. Since the end of the Second World War, commuters had all but abandoned the confusing antics of bus and trolley companies in favor of the ease and convenience of driving their own cars, resulting in congested roads and car parks. The infrastructure needed to be upgraded with a comprehensive and well-planned public transport system that would encourage people to use it. With Westinghouse Electric, one of the most important local companies and other corporate headquarters in the city, the city's political and business leaders saw an opportunity to make the region a leader in the design and production of rapid transit systems. Hence, in 1956, the Port Authority of Allegheny County, PAT, was formed, and three years later, its purpose was changed to acquire the Pittsburgh Railway Company and 32 other local transit companies through eminent domain. 
including all the buses, but also the streetcar lines and some commuter rail lines, such as the pittsburgh McKeesport line. This was just the beginning of a comprehensive plan to revitalize public transport while creating the potential for local industry to manufacture transport systems right in the city. The initiative was led by local financer Richard King Mellon and the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. Mellon took the effort so seriously that he crossed political lines. That's right, although a Republican, he worked closely with the city's Democratic mayor to achieve its goals. The transportation renewal plan was part of a larger project called Renaissance, which aimed to reduce air pollution in the city. The plan aimed to put the city at the forefront of urban regeneration, and the Skybus project was a key part of the initiative. The Port Authority also implemented a revolutionary plan to replace the existing light rail trolley bus lines with a 92-mile, 460-car system connecting suburban communities to downtown Pittsburgh at a cost of approximately $740 million. This proposal was the Transit Express Revenue Line, commonly known as Skybus. Unlike the traditional streetcars in use at the time, the Skybus used its own elevated concrete track and driverless cars with rubber tires. Westinghouse, a Pittsburgh-based company, developed the technology in the early 1960s in conjunction with the Allegheny County Port Authority. With support from the state of Pennsylvania and the federal government, Westinghouse and Pat built a 2,850-meter demonstration track at the Allegheny County Fairgrounds in South Park. The cars, which could run separately or be coupled together, were powered by a pair of 60-horsepower engines and could travel at a maximum speed of 50 miles per hour. Each of the cars was 30 feet 6 inches long and could carry 28 passengers. Power was supplied by a 565-volt, three-phase AC subrail system. The overall plan, called the Westinghouse Transit Expressway, called for 11 lines with 11 stations in the center and a further 47 in the suburbs. Once the plan was approved, three prototype cars were built, each with 26 seats and 28 standing room. As I mentioned before, each car had a respectable top speed of 50 miles per hour. The vehicles were designed with side doors so that they could be used independently or in groups of two or three. The Port Authority also developed an early action program which provided for only 11 miles of Skybus service while at the same time revitalizing bus transport by creating rapid transit routes. The Skybus route was to start in South Hills Village and follow the local streetcar line through the Mount Lebanon and Beachview neighborhoods before reaching downtown Pittsburgh through the then-used Wabash Tunnel. The entire project was to cost $295 million, with the Skybus alone costing $232 million. At the fairgrounds, long queues with waiting times of up to three hours discouraged some passengers, but even so, many others chose to wait. 13,921 men, women, and children paid the 10-cent ticket for this fascinating ride during the 1965 fair, and they loved it. It was autumn, and people could board the Westinghouse prototype transit vehicle for a short ride to the fairgrounds. Long lines waited to board the air-conditioned transit vehicle for a bird's-eye view of the fairgrounds as it circled the racetrack, a scene which was repeated for the Allegheny County Fairs from 1966 to 1971. News of the success of the Skybus system spread quickly. In fact, Walt Disney, who had a good relationship with Westinghouse since the late 1930s, when he had a contract with the company to make plastic toys, was enjoying extraordinary success with Disneyland in California. The futuristic design caught Disney's attention, as did the quiet running of the rubberized vehicles. In 1966, Disney visited the Westinghouse Telecomputer Center in Pittsburgh, known for its innovative advances, and was interested in how computers could be applied to monorails at Disneyland and the new parks he was planning in Florida. Although the Skybus was initially operated manually, the ultimate goal was to make it fully automatic, eliminating the need for a human to operate the vehicles and studies were being carried out at Westinghouse's research facility at the time. However, after this initial triumph, the Skybus project soon came under fire. 
mainly for political reasons. With the death of Mellon and Mayor Lawrence, who had done so much for the project, the Skybus lost two of its most important supporters. There was also growing technical criticism of the system, such as its ability to operate in difficult weather conditions, such as snow or uneven terrain. With that in mind, Westinghouse engineers immediately got to work and solved these critical issues. Snow was no problem for the vehicle, and a secondary track was built on the rails to solve the slope problem. At the same time, the automated vehicles were successfully tested. However, newspapers, radio, and television stations continued to point out the shortcomings of the new transportation system. Additionally, real legal disputes arose between various politicians and companies working for the Skybus project on both environmental and economic grounds. In July of 1969, an alternative to the Skybus plan emerged. The Westinghouse Air Brake Company, which was an unrelated company but founded by the same man, George Westinghouse, several years before he founded Westinghouse Electric, proposed a $114 million plan for a more conventional steel-wheeled light rail system. The 28-mile system would start in the South Hills area, like the current streetcar system, and run through downtown to the East Liberty District. Despite the enticing proposal, the Port Authority voted to accept the Skybus plan on July the 10th, 1969. The Port Authority's decision caused a storm of controversy, both over the decision itself and the way it was taken. You see, throughout the decision-making project, the Port Authority held numerous meetings behind closed doors and showed little sympathy for the Westinghouse Air Brake Company's proposal. And it only got worse. Republican County Commissioner William Hunt criticized the Port Authority and the lack of transparency in their decisions, complaining that their decision was still tied to the use of public money and therefore the public should know the reasons why these decisions were made. The Pittsburgh Press wrote in an editorial that the Port Authority had not only ruled out a public meeting, but had not even been transparent about the Westinghouse Brake Company's proposal. Among Skybus's most vocal critics was then city councilman Peter F. Flaherty, a Democrat who was also a candidate for mayor of Pittsburgh. The councilman accused the Port Authority of favoring Skybus and rushing the decision in order to secure federal funding for the project. Flaherty called for further open hearings to better evaluate the merits of the Skybus and the Western Air Brake Company's proposals. In response, the Allegheny County Commission agreed to hold a series of public hearings on the competing plans. Both Flaherty and John K. Tabber, his Republican opponent for mayor, appeared at the hearings to express their views. Flaherty accused the Port Authority Board of colluding with Pittsburgh area business interests who favored the plan. Tabor split the difference, presenting a plan that included the Westinghouse Air Brake Company and a 16-mile Skybus loop east of downtown. A continuing source of controversy was the Westinghouse Air Brake Company's cost estimate, which the Port Authority's consulting engineer says was at least $100 million too low. The feasibility of the unproven Skybus technology, particularly the switching system, remained a concern. In September, the county commission voted two to one to approve the plan. The commission said that of the 228 million, only 20 to 30 would be paid for by the county, with federal and state funds covering the rest. The commission's decision did not end the controversy. Flaherty, now mayor, remained opposed and used his powers to destroy the project. In 1971, he clashed with the Port Authority over the Wabash Tunnel, which the Skybus would have used to reach the city center. The Pittsburgh City Council voted to give the Port Authority the land at the mouth of the tunnel. Mayor Flaherty vetoed the decision. The council voted again in favor, ignoring his veto. Flaherty then refused to sign the necessary documents, and hence the matter reached the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, which ruled against the mayor in July of 1972. And so it was. The Port Authority spent a total of $9.2 million dollars to rebuild the tunnel and then abandon the work after the system was canceled. But in November of 1971, the city council decided to introduce legislation to fund the Skybus. Construction was halted after Court of Common Pleas Judge 
and ex Alpern issued an injunction, ruling that the Port Authority had not considered alternatives and that Westinghouse had an illegal conflict of interest. Meanwhile, in 1971, the Skybus demonstration rides at the Allegheny County Fairgrounds also came to an end, which was perceived by all parties as a symbolically important moment. In January of 1973, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned the injunction on procedural grounds, finding that the suit was premature and that Westinghouse's role was improper. Opposition to the Skybus project continued, with Flaherty and Hunt calling for a proposal to be put to a referendum in the 1973 election. The projected cost of the early action program, including Skybus, had risen from $228 million to nearly $400 million. And with this news, Governor Milton Sharp offered a $300 million compromise that suspended Skybus and included six commuter rail lines, one of which would go on to become Pat Train. A key issue remained the availability of two sources of funding, state and federal. U.S. Secretary of Transportation John Volpe had announced a $60 million grant in September of 1971, with more money to come as the Skybus project developed. Sharp, as governor, controlled the disbursement of $38 million in state funds. Flaherty argued that the money could be used for any public transportation project and was not tied to the Skybus project itself. The position of the Urban Mass Transportation Administration became crucial. The Skybus could not be built without federal support. The Port Authority, the city, and the state could not agree on an appropriate plan that would serve both the city of Pittsburgh and the surrounding Allegheny County. Even so, the Port Authority remained committed to the Skybus, as did the majority of the county commission. Mayor Flaherty continued to favor a mix of traditional heavy and light rails, as did Governor Sharp. So finally, in 1976, an inter-jurisdictional task force recommended light rail instead of Skybus, and the Urban Mass Transit Authority's support was officially withdrawn. Only the results of the pioneering Skybus project remained. Tests had shown that driverless road transportation could be a viable alternative to rail. Westinghouse Electric continued its involvement in mass transit, later helping to develop the nation's first major fully automated transit system, the Miami Metromover. In fact, their contribution included building the first 12 AdTrans C100 buses for the Metromover. Westinghouse has also been involved in the development of similar driverless transport, such as the Bay Area Rapid Transit System in California, known as BART, and the automated passenger vehicles at several major U.S. airports, including Tampa, Orlando, and Dallas-Fort Worth. Although Skybus was discontinued, as mentioned above, the concept remained alive for many decades. Thanks to the work of the Westinghouse Group, the Skybus concept was later developed into the Westinghouse Airport People Mover System, which as I mentioned a moment ago was successfully installed at airports around the world, but they also installed systems at places like Busch Gardens. A people mover system designed and manufactured by Westinghouse is now also in service at the Pittsburgh International Airport. So in the end, Pittsburgh kinda has its Skybus. And it's worth pointing out that following its acquisition by Canada's Bombardier, the company has continued to enjoy success in the global airport people mover business. These systems are still fully automated, features which are inherited from Skybus. But what is left of the real original Skybus system in Pittsburgh? Well, in the spring and summer of 1980, the county dismantled the tracks, cars, and computer, selling everything for scrap. However, the computer building itself became a park police office. South Park stations, along with the elevated guideway, were all abandoned for a number of years, until ultimately the South Station was demolished in the mid-1980s, leaving only the North Station, now used as the Allegheny County Warehouse. More than 40 years after the last race, the once state-of-the-art Westinghouse Skybus vehicles were nowhere to be found. It is known that two were scrapped when the experiment ended in 1975, but what happened to the third? For at least three of those decades, no one knew. Enter Doug Brendel, a graphic designer and historian from Pittsburgh. 
Doug began searching for the surviving vehicles, following a faint trail for almost two years until it led him to Elwood City, 40 miles northwest of Pittsburgh, where he discovered Hall Industries and its owner, Harold Hall. In the early 1980s, Harold had been involved in a transportation museum in Station Square on Pittsburgh's south side that housed one of the original Skybus vehicles. After seven years, the museum went bankrupt and with no one else interested, Harold moved the vehicle to Elwood City. He covered it with a tarp and it stayed there, lost in the shadows of time, until Doug Burnell came looking for it. Against all odds, the only original 1965 Westinghouse Skybus had been found. From there, Doug Brendel contacted Mike Festco, vice president of Bombardier, who was amazed that a 1965 Skybus, one of the original three, had been found after four decades. When Doug and Mike had visited Industries Hall, it was clear that the vehicle was not in perfect condition but Bombardier envisioned a fully restored original Skybus to proudly display outside their West Milfin headquarters. Bombardier negotiated with Harold Hall and purchased the only remaining original Skybus vehicle. The vehicle was then shipped to the NOAA Commercial Refurbishing Company for a full restoration. The oldest living member of the original Westinghouse Skybus project, Ed Appleby, was identified for his experience as a former Skybus development manager. Another gentleman, Bill Seeger, who was responsible for the Skybus project in the 1960s, was also contacted. From there, Arthur Bistig of Bombardier became head engineer of the project. Ed Nowak of Nowak Commercial Refurbishing was personally involved, and of course, Doug Brendel continued to assist with the restoration process. Doug Brendel's father and brother also contributed to the restoration of the visual design. The Skybus was stripped down and all mechanical and electrical components were overhauled. New windows were ordered to the original specification, a rather expensive undertaking. The interior, which was in fairly good condition, was cleaned and refinished where necessary. The car was repainted in the original off-white color, a shade of which, over the years, has become known as Westinghouse Blue. At one end of the vehicle, the lettering PAAC for Port Authority of Allegheny County was repainted to the original specifications. Although the original Skybus vehicle belonged to Westinghouse, they were identified as belonging to the Port Authority because that was the goal at the time. When completed, the Skybus vehicle looked exactly as it did in 1965. The Skybus vehicle was completely refurbished, not only in appearance, but also in functionality. Some proponents went as far as claiming that if South Park still had the elevated road and support equipment, the Skybus could once again make the rounds of the South Park fairgrounds. But that was not Bombardier's intention. Rather, the restored Skybus was taken to their complex in West Mifflin, where an unveiling and dedication ceremony was held. The failure of the original Skybus project was largely political, but the technological innovations developed for the system have had a significant impact on many modes of transportation around the world. Some believe that this technological evolution could one day bring this revolutionary elevated transport system back in vogue, perhaps offering a solution to growing problems of pollution that plague some parts of our world. Others feel that the Skybus was nothing more than an unpractical, if not tacky attempt to create a then futuristic looking alternative to trains. But I'll let you be the judge and jury on this one in the comment section below. Otherwise, thank you all for watching, and until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.